<laughs> so Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. All right, so we're going to start with this uh, passage first, then we'll explore, and then we'll go from there. So uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder, in your version, you might say, you might say the author, and perfecter of our faith, you might say, and finisher of your faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. All right. So first of all, I'm sure we all know what it is to run, right? So that's not a new thing, right? Now, um, most of us never ran in high school. I didn't run in high school. I tried. It just didn't work. Uh, let's just say after the first lap, I was done. Um, cardio has never been my thing. I think I need to improve on that. You know, uh, somebody here knows when the, the first time I went to go play basketball, how terrible it was. <laughs> After I ran, I was exhausted. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> well, <laughs> so it was, uh, it was fun. Uh, so cardio has never really been my thing. I need to improve on that, but it's never really been my thing. Uh, but it's funny how scripture talks about running. And how and what it says about running. So we just read this passage. We just read this passage. We're going to read it again, right? And we're going to read it again. Now I want you to think about running. So uh, Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of weaknesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do you notice there in verse 1 it says you should lay aside every weight? What happens when you try to run with weight? <laughs> Running by itself is already a problem, right? What happens when you cling, you know, you're, you have 50 pounds attached to you as you're trying to run? It will slow you down, right? You're not going to, first of all, you'll be, more, you'll be exhausted. It will exhaust you faster, and then it will also slow you down, right? So be exhausted, and it will slow you down. So that's what weight does. So it says we should lay aside every weight, and then it says, and sin. So which means your weight may not just be sin. Okay? It says every weight and what? Sin. So sin is a weight by itself, but it says, but you can also have weights that are not automatically sin. All right? Okay. So let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. Or one would say, another version would say, that ensnares us. Your version may say that ensnares us. Or another version may say that uh, uh, easily besets us. I think that's the King James. So it says, the ESV says that, that clings so closely. So however you look at it, this, this scene here is, is almost attached to us, or it's pulling us back. So we are supposed to be running forward, but this thing is holding us back. I said, let us run with endurance. Notice that it says endurance. Last two weeks, we've been talking about endurance, right? We've mentioned it, you know? Now I'm going to ask, I asked this in Bible study, I'm going to ask again. Suffering produces, who remembers? We just talked about this. Suffering produces what? No. Huh? Huh? Endurance. Okay. Oh, don't doubt yourself. Endurance produces what? Character. Okay. And uh, character produces what? Hope. There you go. You got it. You got it. And you can find it in Romans. Uh, that's in Romans 5. All right? Romans 5. We might look at it before, the, before we end today again, just to reiterate this one more time. But here's what he says. He says, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now, remember what he told you. He says that we should run the race with what? We should, we should run the race with endurance. Right? So it says, so in verse 1, it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In verse 2, it shows you that you are just following the example of Jesus. Verse 2, it says what? It says, look into Jesus. Why? Because he's the example you're looking to. Look into Jesus, 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. And he's saying you should look to Christ the same way. You should endure. Why? For the joy that is set before you. And it says, despising the shame. So it's not like Jesus Christ loved the shame. <laughs> you know, you don't have to like everything that comes with something. So it's not like Jesus Christ enjoyed the shame. Oh, yeah, you know, he, no, it wasn't that. It says, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what does it mean for Jesus to be the founder of your faith? What does it mean for Jesus to be the founder or the author of your faith? You ever thought about that? What does that mean? When it says, well, Jesus, the author of your faith. Okay, what does that mean? The author and finisher of your faith. What does that mean? Let's go to the book of Galatians. Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. All right. So, Galatians 2, verse 20. Now, this is Apostle Paul showing you, if you're a Christian, who you are. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you look at verse 21, it says, I do not notify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the Lord, then Jesus, then Christ died for no purpose. All right. So, it starts by saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And it says, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. So the question then becomes, what does it mean that Christ is the author or the founder of our faith? So for him to be the author and founder of, of your faith, right, that means he's the alpha of your faith. He's the A of your faith. So if your faith was from A to Z, he's the A of your faith. Right? So what does that mean? If you look closely here, it says, he is no longer alive. That the life he lives now, he lives in Christ. And Christ who lives in him. So what are we seeing here? Christ is the one who gives us life and everything is through him. And we attain all this by our faith in him. So Christ... So we become nothing and Christ becomes everything. Our identity is attached and rooted in him. So when he says that he's the founder and the author of our faith, everything that we have is in him. He utters this in us. Our hope is in him. Without him, there is no way to see God. Scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to... Who knows, who knows the end of that passage? Please, God. And Christ being the author of that faith that is possible to please God. So without faith in Christ, it is impossible to please God. He is the reason. He is the object of the faith that pleases God. So that is why he's the author of the faith. Then the other part says he's also the perfecter, or he perfects or finishes our faith. What does that mean? Let's go to the book of Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 14. Hebrews 10, verse 14. Now this is very important. <laughs> you know, because sometimes we've heard this stuff before, but I think it's important that we understand it. Because many times we're not growing in Christ 
simply because we don't know who we are supposed to be. Simply because we say we've surrendered, but we've not fully surrendered. We've only given a percentage of ourselves. We don't know what it means to please God. Hebrews 10, verse 14. Now, remember, it says he what? He's the perfecter of your faith. He's the finisher of your faith. Verse 14 says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. By one offering, the offering of the Son of God, his life sacrifice, he says what? He says he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So as you grow in sanctification, this is the proof that you were saved. A believer that says, I am justified in Christ and remains the same way that he came into Christ, there is a problem with your salvation. Why? Because if you are, right there it says, sanctification. Who are being sanctified. You have not just been sanctified, you were justified once. Sanctification is an ongoing process. So it says, he has perfected for all time those who have been sanctified. So he has already done the work. They don't have to do anything. They just have to trust him. They have to believe. They have to follow. And he has perfected this. But let's continue. Verse 15. It says, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. Now, first of all, just context of this passage, because it's very important you get the context of this passage. You know, uh, Apostle Paul is writing, uh, so it's called Hebrews, so it's to Jews. So it's important that you understand this. Because verse 16, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, so this is Apostle Paul saying, saying this. Verse 17 says, then he adds, look at the last verse, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Then look at verse 18. It says, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The question is, where is this quoted from? Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. It's good that we see what scripture says about these things. Jeremiah 31 Verse 33. Jeremiah 31, verse 33 and 34. Okay, it says, For this is the covenant. It's almost, <laughs> he almost quotes it directly from the book of Jeremiah. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now, Apostle Paul says, For this is the covenant I will make with them. In Jeremiah, the Lord spells it out. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. And let's continue. It says, For those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, if you look at what Apostle Paul quoted, right? He quoted the first part. It says, write it on their heart. Then he skips. Then it says, then he adds, right? So then he goes and quotes 34. But Apostle Paul doesn't quote the entire 34. He picks a part of it. But let's look at the entire 34 of, of, of this word. And no longer shall each one teach his, teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So Apostle Paul is saying, This is being fulfilled now. Dr. Trudeau Israel says, this is being fulfilled now. So when he says in verse uh, 14, for by a single offering he has perfected all, he's letting them know that this was the beginning of fulfillment of this prophecy. What Christ did, the perfection that comes in him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. So the question then becomes, what does it mean to run? Let's look at the book of James 1. What does it mean to run? You know, we hear it all the time. Run the race. Okay, great. How, sir? 
How do I run? James 1 verse 12. Here's what scripture says. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promised to those who love him. Now, Hold on, hold on a second. I want you to look at this passage. Now, this is a passage that people will quote, and oh, yeah, cool, and they'll move on. Look at what James says. Let's break it down. James says, so James 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man. So blessed is this man. So this man is blessed. What makes him blessed? You'll see the end of the passage will tell you what that blessing is. It says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So this person is standing in the midst of the trial and tribulation. It's not they are not wavering. It says, blessed is this person. It says, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which has promised, which has, which God has promised to those who love him. So it says, the crown of life is to those who love God. God has promised them. But if you look at the first part, it says that this person has to stand the trial. How do you know you love God? Are you willing to stand the test? If you don't stand the test, what is the proof that you love God? If you look at this passage, right, break it closely. You notice the first part. It says, blessed is the man, right? So it starts with that. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast on the trial. So this person has been as stood the test and then it goes and says for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life isn't it funny how scripture says he who makes it to the end shall be saved how do you make it to the end you stand you know i've heard uh you know the different conversations about you know um uh, different parts of calvinism and different parts of reform theology and there's a part that that you know People have a conflict with the idea that, you know, we are saved once, and when we're saved once, we are, we are held by God. And um, there are different school of thoughts about it. Some are like, well, it's true. Some are like, well, it's not. If it's blah, blah. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. What matters is this. Are you willing to stand? The academic understanding of something is not the same as standing. I can, ad- I can academically understand something, right? I can get it. Like, oh, yeah, of course, da-da-da, one plus one. But when that trial comes, am I willing to stand? Or will the winds of life change my perspective of who God is? Will Instagram change who God is for me? Will Twitter de- redefine God for me? Will YouTube redefine God for me? Or am I sticking to this word? So, The crown of life is given to the one who stands the test. But the crown of life was promised to those who love God. So you stand the test because you love God. Do you see that? Can you see that in your Bible? It was promised to those who love God, but it's only given to those who stand the test. (laughs) So, okay. So, we stand the test, remain steadfast on the trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised him. So running means standing in spite of trials. Your faith is not dictated by what the world says or how your environment treats you. Your faith in God should not be dictated by what the world says or how your environment treats you. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 to 27. Brothers and sisters, I know people want to come to church, have a good time, and it's good. It's good to have a good time. (laughs) But here's the thing. We're here to grow. We're here to know the Lord more. That is why we're here. There is no point. It says, what shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? It doesn't matter. You enjoy everything of life, and then you, you know, I had a wonderful conversation with a lady on, on Friday night. We had a discussion. You know, and and because she wanted to know a little bit about the gospel, you know, we spoke about this stuff, and um, 
And in the middle of the conversation, I realized just how lost she was. I realized just how lost she was. Now, at the end, I asked her, I said, let me pray with you. And she said, no. Um, and I said, okay, don't worry. I'll pray for you. There are a lot of people that are lost. Some of them are very active in church, but they are lost. The standard of God does not change because you're active in church. It remains the same. All right, let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 to 27. So it says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run? See how it keeps using race. Because, <laughs> and I, I, imagine this, from the day you get saved, you're running till the Lord comes. <laughs> That's a long race. It says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? It says, so run that you may obtain it. So which means, don't worry about your brothers and sisters. Don't look at this person and say, well, this person is not running fast. Run that you may receive it. Because when, when, when people are running right, you know, I, I, I was watching the uh, Olympics trials, the ladies' Olympic trials, you know, and uh, there was a lady that, I guess she's the fastest lady now in the U.S. I don't know what her name is. Shikari. Shikari, okay. Uh, fastest lady in the U.S. And, and you know, yeah. And, and that, first of all, she started slow, but she picked it. Imagine if she's running and she's looking at everybody else like, hey, she's not going to make it. She's not going to make it. So you run the race. So this is what it says. So when he's talking about one person receiving, it's not just saying only one Christian or only one believer will ever receive this prize. But it's letting you understand that if a bunch of people are running, one person is going to be, so you be that one person. That's what it's saying. Don't worry about, you be that one person. Follow the Lord. Forget about what every other person wants to do. You follow Jesus. You seek him. If I'm slack enough, don't allow my slack up to make you slack up. Or slack off. <laughs> don't allow my slack off to make you slack off. Follow Christ. You know, follow him. But let's continue. Do you not know that, all, <clears throat> that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. You. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Now, this was like a little, uh, you know, it was like a leaf kind of thing that they put in their head. So that was like the, the thing. So during, during the race, you know, uh, when you're done, they would put it on your head. It's like, it was like a little crown, but it was made of flowers and leaf. So, <laughs> so this is why it says perishable. It's not, it wasn't anything special. But it was a thing of value. Similar to, to uh, the whole idea of uh, trophies or the little, uh, what is it called, uh, medals, right? All those things perish. But people are running for these things. And this is what Scripture says. It says they are running for these things that will not last. But let's continue. It says, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are imperishable. So he's still using the idea of a wreath of a, of a, of a, of a, of a here. Here, like, so he's saying, they do it for the perishable, say, but we are doing it for an imperishable one. But let's continue. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under. At least after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. It is possible to be disqualified after you have preached the gospel to other people. It's possible to be disqualified after you've done great works. Why? Because who you are is not what you say. All right? The you that you try to present to people is not who God sees. God sees the secret things of our heart. None of us can deceive him. You can deceive me. I can look at your face, oh, this brother says, oh, <laughs> they're the most holiest. In the sight of God, God looks at you and like, who is this one? I don't know him. I don't know her. So let's see what scripture says again. We're going to read it one more time. I like to read passage like this twice, just so that we'll, we'll, we'll see it. It says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. You want to receive that prize. 
You don't want to be the last person coming in. You want to be the first. The great thing is, is this is not a race of strength or power. So, so you don't have to be the, the most talented, the most athletic. You don't have to for this one. Any one of us can receive the prize. We all in this room can receive the prize, right? Because it's not dictated by how great or how intellectual we are. It's a thing of faith. It's very simple. It's a thing of trust. But let's continue. It says, receive the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things they do. They do it to receive a perishable breath, but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. So I'm not wasting my time. I'm not shadow boxing. If I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight. It says, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. If the apostle Paul is telling you that he disciplines his body, Someone that, has, that had a conversation with Jesus face to face. If he's telling you he's still disciplined, who are you to think you've already disciplined your body? Who are you to think your body's already under control and you no longer have to do it? Who do you think you are? We, on a daily basis, choose to put our body under. We, on a daily basis, decide and say, today, I will walk with God. Every day. The work you did with God yesterday was great. Clap for yourself. Today, choose to walk with him again. Tomorrow, decide to walk with him. Next week, decide to walk with him. It's a race. Imagine if someone started a race. They're the first. And then along, the, then they start jogging. Everyone's going to run past you. No one cares how well you started. Are you still running? Or have you slowed down? Are you held bonded by the weight of sin? But let's continue. It says, by discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. It says, running means self-control and discipline in the midst of an ungodly world. And you do all this because of the prize laid before you. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 4 to 13. Matthew 24, verse 4 to 13. It says, And Jesus answered, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So, I want you to understand this. He says, No, that Jesus Christ is talking to, okay, Jesus Christ is talking to uh, his disciples, right? He's speaking to his disciples. I say that, see that no one leads you astray. It says, many will come in my name, they'll say, I'm the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Which means, to be led astray, you had to, first of all, have been walking in the path to be led astray. So there are many people that are going to be trying to walk in Christ, and they're going to be led astray, away from Christ. And they're going to follow a, G a different Jesus, a different Christ. Many times, Christ made in the image of men. But let's continue. He says, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. You see, just Christ is saying that they will. Just Christ is also saying they may lead me. He says, many people will be led astray by these guys. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place. But the end is not, is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there will be famines and networks in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. Then by the time you kind of jump to uh, verse, let's go to verse, uh, okay, let's go to verse 9. Then, you would, then they would deliver you up to tribulations and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. People say, well, what, what, why is it that Christians today are not, why? Because Christians are not really standing out. If you were to stand out, people would hate you. It's just the way it is. <laughs> if, <laughs> it's easy to say the same thing that we all agree in when we're in church. What happens when I'm standing in front of people and somebody asks me, oh, what do you feel about homosexuality? And I say, well, it's sinful. You think they're going to like me for that? No, I'm going to cancel quickly. Imagine if I'm trying to have like a YouTube career and, and talk on YouTube. Hey, guys, I'm a YouTube star or what do they call them? YouTuber. <laughs> and then they find out, oh, wow, he's a pastor too and he preaches. Oh, cancel. Right? So when he says the world will hate you, the minute you stand as a believer... On this word, 
in the midst of darkness, the world will hate you no matter what. The problem is this. Most of the time when we say this, we are among believers. That's why nobody hates you. You're among your kind. If you're out there in the world, they will hate you. But let's continue. You know, and then even Christians will still hate you too. Some Christians will say, ah, you are, you are insensitive, blah, blah. They will say different things. So it will come from every angle. But anyway, let's continue. I don't want to get into that. Okay, it says, and it says, and you will be hated by all nations for my sake. Now look at verse 10. And then many will fall away. Look at that. They will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. So in the, in, in the body, many will fall away and then they will betray each other and then they will hate each other. You will have Christians hating Christians, which is madness. Yeah, I think, I think I'm going to have to do a two-part on this. <laughs> it's too much. So I have to round off. So I'm going to read this, and then we're just going to round up with this. The next part, by grace of God, maybe next Sunday. Okay. All right, where was I? It says, um, And many false prophets, look at verse 11. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Many false prophets. It says, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. People will stop loving God because of all the sin around them. Then look at verse 13. Look at verse 13 in your Bible. What does it say? What does verse 13 in your Bible say? What does it say? Read it out. Read it out. Say, say it out so you will hear yourself say it. But the one who makes it to the end will be saved. So Christ is literally telling his disciples, listen guys, on this journey you're about to take, there will be obstacles. And it is deliberate. It's not accidental. Your father knows there will be obstacles. There will be trials, there will be tribulations, there will be people that hate you, there will be different things. You, you will want to leave. If you are not careful, people will lead you to a different Christ. The Christ that's accepting of the things that the Christ of the scriptures will not accept. False prophets will come in my name, saying different things, teaching different things. It says, and the love of many will wax cold. But it says, but if you are able to overcome all these things, if you are able to move away from all these things, if you are able to go through the valley of the shadow of death and realize that I am with you, if you make it to the other side, ah, you will see my glory. But if you fall and you walk into the valley and the shadow and you, and you become an expression of hell, then you are falling away. Let's pray. So this morning, I want us to pray for ourselves, wherever you are, if you're home, you're here. I want you to ask the Lord to help you, to help you to take his word seriously. To help you to take his word seriously. That you will run this race that has been placed before you and you will not go weary. That you will not get tired. You will not be distracted by the noise of hell. Listen, the word of God is the word of God regardless of whoever is telling you. The word of God is the word of God. Ask the Lord to help you. Remember this race you're running? It doesn't matter what your brother to the left or to the right does. It doesn't matter what they do if you're running this race. It doesn't matter. We're here to pick up each other and help each other go, yes. But if you don't make it, it doesn't matter how many people you picked up along the way. That's why Apostle Paul said, everything he's doing is to make sure that at the end of the day, he... It's not a castaway. After all the works he has, after he has preached, that he does not now lose the treasure. That's a lot to help you. That you will not be so cons consumed with working for God that you don't even know who he is. That you're not surrendered to Christ, but you are walking in his name. Mm, that's a, that, that's, ah, mm, that would be a wasted life. That would be a wasted life. That would be a wasted life. 
Ask that the Lord will help you that you will follow him. That you will follow him. You will follow him. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your children. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask you, help your word to be more real to us. Lord, that we will not just hear this thing sound good, go home, remain the same. Help us, Lord, to see what you want us to be, who you want us to be. Father, we ask you that your word will show our iniquity to us. Help us, Lord, not to fall by the wayside. Help us, Lord, to follow your son, Jesus Christ. Father, keep our eyes on your son, that the example that he has set that we will follow, that we will see the joy that is placed before us, and that we will run this race. Thank you, Father, for in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.